Hey, what is up, everyone? This is Jake Hofer with Exodus. On this week's episode of Trail Cam Radio, Chad and Cameron head out to Pennsylvania to sit down with Steve Shirk. Steve is a Pennsylvania native who hunts the big woods and mountain country. He's been on the podcast a few other times, and we have those links in the description below. In this particular episode, we talk about Steve's shed season recap, antler restrictions, mobile hunting versus set locations, winds and thermals, and three tips for new deer hunters. Be sure to keep an eye out for his episode of Whitetail Cribs that will be coming to a Wednesday very soon. Also, one last thing before we do get started, we're giving away a camera that was donated by a first responder that wants to give someone else on the front lines for COVID-19 an Exodus Trail camera. We have two ways for people to get involved. The first is if you've been working through these hard times, trying to get things back to normal and keep people safe, please leave a comment on what you do for work and use the hashtag first responder. If you aren't one of those folks, but you know someone who has been uh, working extremely hard through these times and you want to nominate them to win this free camera as a nice gift, Tag their name and uh, tell us what they do for a living. And on episode 113 of Trail Cam Radio, we're going to put all the names into a hat and give uh, one of these cameras away as a thank you. Um, we know it's a difficult time, so. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and get in the episode. Lights, camera, follow the trail. Ready to shoot. If you know where a deer's bedding and you know where he's eating, that deer should be dead. Camera. If you're passive on a deer, what you're doing is you're teaching. I've got 30 bucks in the Michigan record book. Everyone but one has had at least one previous wound on his body. Some had as many as four. <laughs> Trail Cam Radio from the guys at Exodus. Hey, today we are sitting down with uh, a guy that's been on the podcast probably more than anyone else, Steve Shirk. <laughs> uh, Shirk's Guide Service, also an Exodus black hat we're excited about having you on that team same here um so we'll have some some written you know it seems like all of your followers and the, and the people paying attention to what you're doing on social they really really enjoy the long format of how you write those detailed posts so we're going to be uh you're going to be sharing some information on our on our website oh, i'm uh, looking forward to it with some blog articles so that's something that uh, we're looking forward to and of course we we had the opportunity today to do a whitetail cribs uh, deer camp kind of edition um, with your with your uh, camp and family, um, so that's that'll be pretty cool. We're excited nope. about that about that going live too. So. Great, but uh, I guess you're a you're a guy that I don't want to say up and coming, but there's a lot of people that ask, hey, do you know that Steve Shirt guy? Do you know, like, there's a lot of there's some buzz going around with your name, and I think that's because uh, I think it's because of a couple of things. One. I think that you have a different perspective and you're not afraid to talk about it. Mm -hmm. You're not always following suit to what the industry is talking or, or telling people to do. And uh, you're not afraid of work. Like you're, pu you're putting the work in and doing it on your terms. So I think those sure. are the things that people are really resonating. Um, or, or that's what people are resonating with you, I guess. Um, but let's recap your, your post season and, and, and your, I guess, shed season. For, sure. For yeah. It was, it was the best season I ever had. Uh, antlers, not every one was a shed, but I found like, I think at least 45 antlers, but, uh, it was a season where I probably put more time and focus on shed hunting. Usually I've been maybe 50, 50, like post-season scouting, learning new areas, learning more about particular deer. This season, it was just one of those things. I said, I'm just going to go out there and see how many sheds I can find. Some of them I do think I got lucky on, but then some of them I feel that, you know, it was due to my effort. And uh, I just hope it doesn't backfire because I might have missed out on a little bit of the postseason scouting. But I'm confident that even through all the miles I put in and the sheds I found that, you know, that I'm still going to benefit from it. Um, and then one good thing, you find a lot of sheds that, and if they're fresh, it just means that there's more bucks for next year so uh no i just it was an awesome shed season and geez i, I still found i'm still finding a few here and there yeah i seen so. that the other day you put on like uh, 16 miles in a day yep, and found one of, shed i'm thinking to myself 16 miles i got <laughs> my feet are my feet are broken after 10 11 or 12 <laughs> like i don't know if i keep up with you huh. um but some of those spots that you were walking you said that maybe you've missed out on some 
uh, some of the postseason scouting. I assume like you were shed hunting new areas in. Oh yeah. Is that? Yeah. The thing about the only thing I think shed hunting in this area in the winter time, you can also hurt yourself because you're focusing more on where deer were in the winter time. Uh -huh. So that's where you might lose out. Uh, just because you found a shed in a spot doesn't mean you might have really found where a buck is living in hunting season. Right. So, but we did have a pretty mild winter. So really, I also noticed a lot of bucks hung in their fall or natural core areas because the weather didn't get bad enough to push them out. Yeah. So in some ways, I mean, obviously I have no regrets in just focusing on sheds. I mean, who doesn't love shed honey? <laughs> so, uh, and I, no, I still learned a lot. Um, and I found some new bucks that way, deer that I had no clue were even out there. So uh, I definitely benefited from it. And uh, I'm, anything I learned this past season, it's gonna, I'm gonna definitely use it this, from this past postseason. What, uh, was there any shed or anything that you saw or picked up on during that postseason scouting or shed hunting that um, kind of stands out? Well, I mean, my favorite shed, maybe it doesn't stand out as far as learning anything, was that buck I found, uh, Crazy 12. Yeah. A lot of people know that I hunt. Um, that was my favorite one because that was like my number one target deer. And so maybe you don't kill a buck but you find at least one of his sheds, you feel like you got that, that little piece of them still. So uh, I was super happy to find at least one of his sheds. And then there was just, there was a couple, like I said, some of those newer bucks. When, whenever you find sheds of a buck you don't know of, but it's a really good buck, like that gets you pumped up, you know, because that's just another one for the list, another deer that's gonna, ha you're gonna have history with. and another new story that's starting to get written so yeah, absolutely yep so let's um you know it's almost june it's basically the end of may we're memorial day today actually while we're recording this um <laughs> we always seem to record at the weirdest times <laughs> yeah it has been uh you know we're relatively close together you know three three and a half three hours um but yeah but it seems like uh, i mean it's never a a chore i guess to get no. over here or for you to come to us or whatever but it does seem like it's always <laughs> odd times i think the last podcast we did it was like 11 o'clock at night or something wasn't it really the one late here was, was like 11 at night and then the one in harrisburg we winged it before you guys it was early in the morning the show. Yeah. yeah that's all right i'm that's how I am too. I try to fit as much in my <laughs> schedule as I can, preferably as much more time in the woods in my schedule. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Um, but let's let's fast forward a little bit, um, and let's talk a little bit about uh, what you're doing doing during the summer months. I know that um, you know there's I guess guys on complete opposite opposite ends of the spectrum. There's guys that say stay out of the woods during the summer, leave mm -hmm. the deer alone give them a chance to, you know, do their thing. And then there's other guys saying you need to be in the woods 24 seven. Where do you, yeah. I guess a couple things, where do you fall in line on that spectrum? And then two, where do you prioritize if you were going to, I guess, rank the year in seasons like postseason, summer, fall, winter, like where do you rank the importance of, of summer scouting? I think, I think ranking wise, I don't know if I feel like I could rank it because every season has its own its own reason to be out there. And I think the number one reason for the summer is inventory. Uh, this is a time when bucks are more grouped up in bachelor groups. So if you want to know 99% of the bucks that are in your hunting area, I think you got to be out there in the summertime. Um, running a lot of different, you know, running a lot of cameras just like you would in the fall. And uh, you'll notice uh, it's just another one of those times of year where you're going to get bucks in the summer on camera that you really have no clue of or in the fall, but it kind of, it leads you on, it leads you on to them though. You, now, now you're on a mission. Some of the biggest bucks I've ever found in the summer, uh, I ne may have never even found where they lived in the fall, but it, at least it gets you a, to a starting point. Yeah. So you, you got to be out there this time of year to know what's going to be out there next fall. And just because a buck made it through last hunting season, maybe you got his sheds or you have pictures, doesn't mean he's alive right now. So if you can keep tabs on him all throughout the year, you're going to stay more connected. I totally agree. Yep. Just to uh, 
I mean, I'm sure 90% of our listeners or people watching this on YouTube have already listened to a previous podcast or watched one of your videos, but um, just put some context to the areas that you're hunting. Like this isn't, um, you know, we're not hunting swamp ground or ag ground. This is kind of hill country, but yeah. I'll go ahead. And yeah. Well, we're it. hunting what's called the Allegheny mountains. Yep. It's not all Allegheny national forest, but a lot of it is. Um, there, there may not be the steepest mountains, but it's still from guiding. I've learned that these woods are very challenging. A lot of people come here and, you know, it's like, wow, I didn't realize it was going to be, you know, this much of a challenge. So it's real challenging hunting. Uh, it's real rewarding hunting though. Um, and you know, there's, there's clear cuts. There's, there's a big variety of different types of habitat here. Not so much swamp, like you had mentioned in other places. Don't really hunt much for swamps, but there's, you know, there's areas where there's just miles of open hardwoods. There's, there's clear cuts, there's brushy areas. So just really for, for deer, they have just a little bit about everything that they would want here. So you, uh, you know, you mentioned the guide service, um, Shirk's guide service just a few moments ago. And while we were shooting, I guess, getting ready to shoot that Whitetail Cribs episode, there was something that you had said that kind of popped into my mind. So I want to ask you about it. And, um, I guess in your words, describe the camp success like prior to 2003 mm -hmm. describe it post 2003 and then what uh you attribute that success to sure well before 2003 maybe you guys can take or yeah maybe you can take some photos before the antler restriction started um, an 80 inch eight point was considerably a wall hanger here like that's the, if you shot an 80 inch eight point i mean it would be it would be a big party here at camp so uh and then all of a sudden you know they came up with the antler restriction and they also uh you know they there's they created you know more doe permits so they thinned the herd down some and we were all all of us camp members were a little bit unsure of what the future was going to be and uh so but deep down me and a lot of the other guys even though we were unsure, we we were looking forward to it because we believed in what what the future was supposed to be. What they were saying it was going to create healthier deer and bigger bucks. So, uh, you know, they they started the restriction, and honestly, after 2003, I mean, I heard heard them say that it might take 10 years before you see results. I think we were seeing results in two to three years because really. You go one season and you start letting letting bucks live, you're gonna see results the next year. And uh, so I can't even say myself or a lot of us other guys here at camp were, were what we call trophy hunters. But uh, once we started seeing the effects of the antler restrictions mainly, then we're all like, hey, you know, even if it is legal, maybe we should consider passing it up because you know, who doesn't want a big buck? Right. And uh, so that's that's what we've done. And then even now, you know, so many years later, 2020 now. So it's like set almost 20 years, 17, 18 years. Uh, I I th almost think it's getting better and better because I don't even though, you know, everyone would love to shoot a big buck. It really has pushed a lot of people away because. Uh, one thing is, as soon as you start pushing hunters out of the woods, especially in gun season, our gun season is way post rut when there's not a lot of activity. If you don't have a lot of hunters in the woods, the deer aren't moving because they're they're worn out from the rut. So, uh, so now, you know, the guys that are hunting aren't really seeing much. You got to really more put the miles on or do really do your homework to get to know the deer that are in your area. So it's, it's created a much more challenging type of hunting now. But if you put the time and the work in, I mean, not to brag, but if you watch the cribs, there's, there was only two bucks on this wall before 2003. And now at our camp, we don't even have, can hardly have a there's spot no for room another left. <laughs> yeah, and that's, I, maybe we've gotten somewhat better as hunters, but for the most part, we've just been blessed that I think Pennsylvania made a tremendous 
tremendously good decision on the antler restriction and lowering some of the deer numbers. I know there's going to be people out there that just really hate me saying that. And I understand that it might be more fun to see more deer or whatever you liked about it then, just shooting any buck you've seen. But from a quality habitat perspective and what's best for the deer herd in general, I think it's best for the deer now. And then the bonus is you get trophy bucks. Absolutely. So, so what, um, you know, the APRs, every state kind of has their own take on, okay, it's three up on one side or has to be an 18 spread. Like every, I know Michigan's different, Pennsylvania, there's all these states that have different um, takes and actual legislation on that antler restriction. So what, what is it in this specific part of the, part of the state? Well, <laughs> My opinion is it's not so much, to me, you shouldn't be seeing major trophy bucks due to letting them get from one to two years old or two to three. But one thing in the, these kind of woods, it's tough to always spot three on one side. You know, there's thick cover in spots, the deer aren't moving. I know there's been many deer that we've seen and it's like, man, the rack looks huge, but I, I can't see three for sure. So they get away. So that's number one. A lot of bucks just get away because there's still always that chance that, geez, it could be a giant four point or spike or, you know, so it's hard to identify that it has three on one side. I think that's been a bigger or had a bigger impact than just letting the deer get from one to two to two to three years old. But then the second biggest impact is how it's pushed hunters away. When you don't have hunters, deer don't get shot. So there's less and less hunters up here every year. And in some ways it's a bad thing. But then again, for a hunter, we, we also don't wanna see a guy everywhere we look or every parking spot filled up. So uh, those two things there, either the, the challenge of finding the three on one side or the lack of hunters have resulted into why we have a tremendous, tremendously good herd of trophy bucks. Makes sense. Yeah. Absolutely. So Cameron just had a had some input or quite a couple of additional questions on the APRs. And, it, you know, there's a I guess from what I'm gathering, you know, there's people that have input that are saying that APRs can actually hurt you as mm -hmm. far as um, trying to grow uh, trophy bucks. Right. And the thought process there is that, you know, a studly two year old with three point up on one side is getting killed or is a legal bucket too. Yeah. Um, you know, what could he have been at five? And then on the flip side, maybe you have a giant four pointer that's two, three, four, five years old that is never legal to shoot and still kind of spreading his genes in, in, in the pool. So what's your, sure. what's your take on that? Yeah. So I think that we have to draw the line that you can only get so far with the antler restriction that you're not gonna be able to just ever go through the herd, especially in Pennsylvania, and everyone be selective and like, he's got bad genes, he's got good genes. That's never gonna happen. But for the most part, and like I mentioned here before, we only had two deer on this wall at this camp before 2003, and now, now it's just plastered. And that's all when after the antler restriction started. So I think, the outcome outweighs the situations where you know we were shoot or letting go deer that have poor genetics. More, I think most of the time you're gonna you're gonna have deer that when you let them live to four, five, six years old, they're still gonna have a quite impressive rack. Are we missing out on probably some 150 to between 200 inch deer? I would say absolutely. But it was far greater, it's far greater now than 20 years ago when we're, we're shooting these guys, yeah. you know. So I'll, I'll take that any, any day. And I just, is, I'm not a biologist and I, I'm sure genetics play a huge role into growing giant trophy deer. But I do know and believe that age, no matter what, they're going to get bigger when they get older that I don't for maybe there's a very rare one that goes downhill after two years old. But other than that, all the deer you're letting go are getting bigger. So 
I think that's where we have to look at it and just draw the line and say, yeah, we're, we're, we're probably making a mistake here and there, but for the most part, we're still, we're still way ahead of what we had before. So age over genetics. Definitely. Basically. For this situation. Now, if you were, if you were, uh, on a preserve, uh, or hunting ranch and you had massive amount of acreage, I totally agree that you should be more selective in, in your uh, in what you take if you want to if you want to create you know Boone and Crockett deer better. But for me, I mean, yeah, I'd like to shoot 150 inch deer, but if I shoot a six or seven year old deer like that one 10 point up there, he's probably only 110 inches, but they aged him at seven and a half. Telling you what, it was a pretty good feeling when you kill a deer that old. Heck yeah. To know that, especially on public land, the who he survived, the knowledge in that brain of his, and that one time someone was able to to defeat him or however you want to call it, uh, I just think that it doesn't get much better than that. Well, the other side of it too is you know, as uh, the hunting culture kind of changes a little bit and people get behind APRs and get behind QDM. I feel like uh, the mentality of the way people are hunting is, is changing. Oh, I think yeah. that's I think that's pretty evident. So if there is a studly two-year-old, yeah. let's say that there's, he's a, whatever, 120-inch two-year-old, Pope and Young two-year-old, 125 inches, mm -hmm. just because he's legal doesn't necessarily mean you have to shoot him. Like there no, are guys don't. passing those type of deer if they sure. think that they can well, I don't know, protect them. I don't think you can really protect them, but I know what you mean. If yeah. you're not pulling the trigger, you're making a conscious decision to try to push that deer into the next age structure. And yeah. as you said, as those deer get older to three, Absolutely. four, five years old, that's when you're going to start seeing 150 plus inch deer. Yeah. And then, like I from. said, and I, I do believe the antler restriction may not be working as good in certain types of areas. And I can only speak for what's in this area, what we've seen. But we already have, we have rugged, tough country to hunt, which is more challenging, which also leads to pushing more hunters away because it's just rugged and tough to hunt. So you throw that in there. Now these deer are getting older. It just, it just has a bigger effect. You know, you have less hunters, deer are already getting past stuff anyway. So now <laughs> I think, I really think even the majority of even legal bucks not only think i know they're they're living there's not enough hunters in these woods now to even shoot half of them that's a two-year-old deer that that doesn't even have that much of an education yet yeah so it the the lack of hunters in in these kind of areas it's also right or wrong whether it's good, good or bad i don't know but it's definitely benefiting these deer as far as getting them older and it's funny because I guess through this, maybe your dad can talk a little bit about this uh, or attest to it, but like the seventies and eighties, like everybody had deer camp here. Yeah. Like this was the spot. Like yep. everyone took the week off work. Everybody yep. came to rifle hunt. Yep. Oh, and I, I was even here then. I wasn't really hunting that much then, but like I said before, we have a deer hang out there and it, it, it would be spikes and four points for the most part. Yeah. You know, and everyone was thrilled. And then if you'd see it, if there's an 80 inch eight point hung on there, you'd have 10 vehicles up here looking at it. <laughs> now you shoot an 80 inch eight point, you're lucky to get a high five. Right. That's yeah. just, and you, you look at the stats starting, you know, roughly 2003, you look in this room here, all of a sudden, big buck, big buck. I mean, the yeah. wall is getting yeah. taken up and, and I don't, I, I think the hunters in our family are, tremendously hard hunters i'm not even saying we're the most skilled but uh the hard work is is definitely been enough to to make yeah. it happen that's cool and so yeah if you're willing to if you're willing to work hard in pennsylvania by god uh, 120 inch deer at least is is very capable if not i mean pennsylvania we're getting closer to those 200 inches every year so it's yeah. awesome so, so um you know as you run your guide service uh, and running your clients in and out. Are you, are these guys packing in their own stands? Are they mobile hunting? Are you, do you have fixed locations or do you have stands already hung? Do you have spots picked out? Like what's your, what's your method there? And do you prefer 
pre-hung stand locations versus being mobile, or does it make a difference, or is, well, is it maybe both? Well, it's it's a whole bunch. Yeah, it's a little bit everything. Like safety wise, I'd rather have someone bring their own stand because number one, they're familiar with it, they're comfortable with it. Liability is more taken off me than if they have an accident in my stand. I'm sure the insurance company is going to say, well, that's his fault. So safety wise, I'd rather see someone use their own stand. But on the other hand, there's other issues where we may not have as much time to get all their stands set up, especially on a three day hunt. They arrive on a Sunday night. We don't we don't want to make a guy lose a whole day of hunting or two getting all the stands up. So we're going to have stands up anyway to make their hunt you know, more enjoyable. Um, but. Truthfully, uh, I wish there was no law that you in Pennsylvania that you had to have uh, your stands up in a certain amount of time. They only give you, I think, two weeks before uh, opening day archery season. That's that's not a good law. That two weeks maybe in, in my shoes it's not a good law because two weeks working another job. You know, I do landscaping. I have a family. Doesn't give people enough time to get their stands up. So. That's, but that's a whole nother issue. But my point is, is uh, you have to, you have to be suitable for the hunter and then the area that you're hunting. Like if, if we have a lot of guys that say, I only hunt out of a ladder stand or I prefer a buddy stand and I'll, those stands have to be set up way in advance. Right. Just, just for the fact that we can't be doing all that and, you know, in an hour or two or so it, it all boils down to what the hunter's needs are, the area we're taking them, and you know those kind of things. What about your personal preference? My personal preference is a climber. Mm -hmm. uh, what I I like to be very mobile, and say if I'm hunting a scrape, a lot of times uh, the majority of the wind will will maybe blow a certain direction one day or another. I like to be able to get where the wind is right in a hurry, rather than you know if I have a big two man stand set up that spot's done for the day, you know, just because I can't adjust. But yeah, I, I'm totally all for mobile hunting. I, I wish everyone felt that way, but there's a lot of even, especially older guys, seems like guys 60 years or older or something like that, they're not comfortable in the mobile setups. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they like the big railings. They, they don't want to be up real high. And I, I understand, you know, it may not be the best setup, but if it gets people in the woods and you have to be comfortable, then that's what we got to do. But if you can be mobile, either with the, the hang-ons, the saddles, or climbers, your odds definitely get better, in my opinion. Agreed. So you mentioned something there about hunting the right wind. And yeah. I'm going to play, I guess, Deadville's advocate on this a little bit. But uh, we had talked a couple months ago, or maybe it was a month, I don't know. A, a little while back about uh, writing an article on the wind and thermals mm -hmm. as part of that Exodus Black Hat um, program. And you have a different perspective on wind and thermals in, in hill country. What? Yep. Well, the thing is, that. is if you're going to hunt wind and thermals, you have to rely on something being consistent. And then when you throw mountains in the picture, you have so much inconsistency. There's... Now there are areas where, say there's a north or a west wind, the wind will do the same things if those wind directions are occurring. Like even a west wind sometimes in a valley will blow the same as a north wind. You kind of have to get familiar with, with that area. You know, you're not, you can't even go in there one time and be like, well, this is which way the wind's blowing and this is what it's always gonna do. It's not gonna, it's not gonna work. Um, but there's, I also believe that deer have understood that in this area that they can't constantly rely on the wind and thermals either. So they've grown to finding, finding areas to bed and hide more cover related or getting away from pressure or sight advantage points. So uh, I do believe there's areas, maybe not so many here, but there's areas where deer and especially big bucks are focusing more on wind and thermals and choosing their, their bedding areas almost 100% due to that. But here, because it's so inconsistent, I, I hardly focus on that at all. So when you're 
I guess trying to pinpoint um, how a deer is using the terrain. Like, so there's no thought going into the wind and how you're going to set up with that particular wind. Like, if you think a, let's just say you think a deer is using a bench or um, a, a saddle, just a basic terrain feature, and you know you're checking your cameras. You're a bit a advocate for for trail cameras, and you're checking the like a lot of guys will check the the weather on their phone the, like, mm -hmm. and they'll say it's a west wind. Yeah. Now I agree with you 100%. It doesn't matter what the weather station is saying yep. because in the hills the wind is doing something different because Absolutely. it's going to be wrapping around a point yep. um hitting, you know, very steep um steep hillsides, it's going to swirl, yep. it's going to wrap around a bowl. If the wind speed changes, oftentimes the yeah, wind direction will change. But yep. m my point is that um I guess I'm, what I'm trying to pry here is when you're setting up, are you paying any attention to the wind as far as what you think, how the deer would be using it? Yeah, I. this is just for myself, though, because uh, I, I like to hunt mainly out of climbers or more mobile setups. Yeah. I usually more focus on a north or a west wind because I love to hunt cold fronts. And when you have cold fronts, they're usually north or west winds. Mm -hmm. So I try to focus, say if I'm hunting a scrape, I'm gonna be at least ahead of time set up downwind of that scrape. Now say I go there in the morning and I get to my tree and the wind's not doing what I, what I think it's gonna, I will automatically set up to another tree. It's, it's really good when you choose a spot to look around and make sure there's multiple trees because you you don't want to waste a, possibly a whole day by going to your spot and the wind's not right. The one good thing about the big woods is deer a lot of times come in from different directions. So, but if you're hunting a scrape that you're that you're or a trail or something like that that you're really that's where your shot is focusing on. That's where the wind's more of a factor. But for the most part, where the kind of spots I hunt, I see deer showing up from almost any direction. But so every setup uh, has its own its own rules, I would say, or mm -hmm. what I'm looking for. There's sometimes I'll just gamble and the wind's blowing everywhere, but I'm just not sure where the deer are gonna come from. But if the wind's blowing, if I'm hunting a scrape, like I said, and the wind's at least in my favor 60% of the time, then then I'll you know I'll stay in that spot. Right. So. When you're hunting scrapes, do you see um, you know guys talk about the J hook, like deer J hook, even like when they're going in their bedding locations. Do you see that at all? Deer's going downwind and scent checking scrapes like prior to actually coming in. And... Yeah, I've where, where I where I really get nailed is because I love to grunt. It seems like when I grunt, they get downwind even more. But then if so, it's kind of like a catch twenty two. Uh, if because you have to grunt just because it works so good. But then if I'm not grunting. I don't see them coming in like a hundred yards downwind a lot. Mm -hmm. Just seems like sometimes just like 20 yards. Yep. And they'll just kind of maybe even not even visit the scrape, but just scent check it that way. So getting your setups 20 yards from a scrape, that may be a problem. You might want to be more like 40 mm -hmm. because more than likely, you know, if it's a mature buck, his first check is going to be 20 yards at the scrape. So then, you know, you got a perfect shot. So right, yeah, 20 yards either way. Yep, exactly. Yeah, makes sense. So. Makes sense. Yep. Um, so with paying less attention to the like wind and thermals, uh, which is, you know, that's different than a lot of people's perspective sure. um, in, in the whitetail woods. What about scent control? Like you do anything for <laughs> scent control? <laughs> Not even one thing. Like, <laughs> especially going back to the deer camp thing here, uh, Whatever we cook in this small space, that's what you smell like. <laughs> so usually in the mornings, I smell like bacon grease. And uh, and I'm not saying that it's a cover scent. Maybe it is for all I know, but I've, believe me, as serious as a hunter as I am, especially for deer, years ago, I, I feel I tried everything there was to do about scent control. I would, I would shower, wash my clothes with scent proof your scent killer material, never bring my clothes inside. I'd put them in a scent proof bag with like leaves and, you know, scent products, do all that work. Then I get in the stand and think, well, maybe I don't really have to care about the wind. As soon as one deer gets downwind, I'm auto automatically burnt. 
So, and I've had people say, well, you still got to do it anyway. But I, I why? If it's not going to work, you're, unless it was going to work like 80%, I th why are we doing all this stuff? Why are we spending money on something that doesn't work and take an extra time and hours out of each hunt when we could probably use that time more effectively for even more hunting or scouting? So truthfully, I think it's, if it, it's all just a myth. I, I really think that... Uh, I think some of it works a little bit, but if you if you're not going to be able to use it and not worry about the wind, then why are you using it? Well, the thing that um, the thing that I guess gets me like in hill country or aggressive terrain, like you could take a scent proof or a scent free shower, scent proof your clothes, do whatever. Yeah, you walk a half a mile Absolutely. and you're soaked in sweat. Absolutely, soaked in sweat. No doubt. Yeah, and obviously when you sweat, that's making the scent ratio that's, even greater so that's it yeah that's that's my point is it all sounds great like hey do this use that and uh the deer aren't going to win you well i'm willing to try something if you can tell me it works or maybe give me a free shot at it yeah and then i'll if we can beat the wind or beat a deer's nose ultimately though that would be the greatest tool ever made probably more than any gun bow camera because that's their ultimate weapon against us, but to this day, I don't believe it's out there. They don't. It's not out there today, and I'm not sure that it'll ever happen. Exactly. I don't think that we know enough yep. about their biology to even grasp, Absolutely. you know, how they how they use their nose. Yeah, I'm no biologist, but I would say like one tiny little scent particle they pick up, yeah. and that's all that they need. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. The main thing is is if you're if you're able to hunt areas, and it's probably not so much for this area, but obviously if you can use the wind to your advantage, if you're downwind, that 80% of the deer's chances of smelling you are gone, I think, mm -hmm. you know, especially watching where you walk in and so forth. But yeah, so if you can use the wind, you've, you've, already, you've already put yourself in a much better situation, but here, it's honestly a lot more challenging. It's so hard, it, yeah. yeah, that's another way where big woods mountain hunting is also going to throw another curveball at you. you. You mentioned something right there and I have uh, entry and exits jotted down in like in my, in my show notes. And uh, you know, that's one thing that I feel like oftentimes is either overlooked or not enough weight put into is exit and entry, whether that's uh, clean scent free, not, I don't want to say scent free, but making sure that the wind is pushing your, your scent somewhere where deer are not pushing your audible noise yeah. on your way in somewhere where, where deer are not. So with, I guess there's several questions here I want to ask. One is how in the heck do you tackle that with clients? Like, <laughs> because everyone is going to walk a different pace. Everyone's going to want to, yep. you know, wear a certain kind of gear and you know, kind of do their own thing. Yeah. So how, what the heck do you do? Well, for clients, I try to I try to think about areas where where we can expect to see deer in almost any direction. Because if I have three clients to put in stands that morning, and the wind's not right for one spot, that just ruined everyone's hunt that morning. So I try to put them in spots and say, hey, the deer can come in from any direction. That kind of eliminates that, no matter which way the wind's blowing. I sure hope it, in all whatever shooting lanes they have that they at least have a few good windows where the wind's in their favor, but that's just mountain hunting. I, I can't go out there any day and promise that the wind's going to be right or that you might right. just be in a spot that day where the wind wasn't in your favor and it's just hunting. Um, but uh, as far as uh, getting people around the woods, We've, we've had a lot of hunters say, you know, I can do this. I can go just about anywhere, but I, I've learned it's just better to be safe. And a lot of our spots are actually really easy to get to. And I've part of my postseason scouting every year is to try to find more easy spots. I'm not really scouting as much for myself, but for, for our clients, just making sure that, you know, wherever we take people 90 some percent chance or better that I know they're going to get in there easily and comfortably. And as far as, uh, I'm not too worried, like I said, usually about when I'm guiding the wind going in or out, just because I already brought up that 
we're, we're in areas where we believe the deer are coming from all different directions, mm -hmm. especially during the rut. You, you almost anywhere you hunt, probably even like ag ground, you can see deer just do, coming. They're, they're crazy during the rut. They're, they're, they're doing all kinds of things. But, uh, I think the noise, when you brought up the noise issue, I think that's possibly just as important as anything, especially if sometimes there'll be me and three guys walking and anymore, I, I don't even like to walk through the woods with three guys. So we'll try to, we'll try to drop people off. Like say we're on a, on a logging road that you can drive or the back road, uh, even have them follow us. We'll have the trail marked with ribbon or tacks. You go there, drive down the road a little further, drop another guy off. It's, I don't really like to, you know, walk that many people through the woods. If we do, it's gotta be somewhere quiet, like on a trail, logging road, or yeah. It's, I think a lot of people overlook the noise issue. And if, especially a mature buck, if he hears sticks crack in and going right up to your stand, I promise you, there's a good chance he's not gonna check that spot out. Now, maybe if you're walking in, if you're making noise, I've done this before, <laughs> sounds crazy, but when I felt I've made a little too much noise going to my stand, I'll start grunting some, because then I'm, I'm at least telling them, oh, okay, it was a buck. But I'm not suggesting you, know, you do that every time, but that's just something to keep in mind. If you feel you've made some noise going to your stand, just start grunting before you get into your stand yeah so. I, I i agree with some of that i think the the takeaway there is if you're going to make noise try not to sound like a human as exactly. simple and dumb as that sounds yeah. like oh, that's you're right yeah that's kind of it yeah because i'm sure you or whoever's watching you can make like the slightest little sound when a deer's in front of you and they just freak out like a little creak in your stand or whatever they they will they don't put up with anything. So obviously, whether they see or not, if it's a noise that doesn't sound right, you're, they're not gonna be coming by your stand. Right or natural. Exactly. Like metal tings, obviously, yeah. like yep. nightmare. You're done. Yeah. So noise is Agreed. a big issue. Agreed. Um, so there's just a couple other things. Uh, I guess there's one more specific uh, question I want, I want to get to, and we're going through some of this stuff uh, pretty fast, actually. It seems, you know, every hunter evolves and they go, it feel, I feel like they go through phases where, you know, you're trying different tactics and trying to figure out the right way to do something, try to figure, trying to figure out who you are as a hunter or as a person. And then it takes a couple of years and you figure that out and things start to kind of mesh together. And then mm -hmm. you finally find your stride yep. and find, you know, you get into that stretch where you're really finding a lot of success. And it seems like that's the point where you are. So over the last, 10 years or so, um, give the listeners or, or viewers, give them three things that have made the biggest impact on your, on, on your hunting success for you and your clients. Sure. Okay. Number one, I would think the most important thing is to truly devote yourself into like a year round deer hunter. Like if you're just going to go out there, you know, do your scouting two weeks before season or even not even much different than that. Like you, if you want to see consistent success, like I'll be honest, as much as I love to deer hunt and scout, there are days when the mood isn't really there. But like, I know if I don't do it, just like it's your job or, you know, you're in sports or whatever. If you're not constantly out there honing your edge or whatever you want to call it, you're, you're not going to have success. Like I've been watching the, the Michael Jordan, uh, whatever it's called, the, yeah. the documentary. Yeah. Like, and I'm not saying I'm the Michael Jordan of deer hunting, <laughs> but, but I look at that guy and it's like, I relate, I can relate this to hunting because like that guy, it, the one, the one thing it said was the day after he won the championship, the one year he was practicing for next year, the next day not even taking a break the one year because he felt he needed some, to work on some things. And I think if you do want to be a great deer hunter, that's what you got to be doing is, and it's not so much just scouting and running cameras like, okay, what can I improve on? There's so many little things out there that you can improve on that, you know, in the off season, that's when you want to be doing it. You're not going to make yourself a great consistent deer hunter 
just in the fall season. It, that's it doesn't. Maybe there's some people that have been getting lucky, but I just I just know that it's got it there for every season, whether it's spring, summer, fall. There's reasons we need to be out there. There's things we're learning. So that I mean that's the number one thing is really just devoting yourself to it, and and uh, it's it's work, but when you when it does start to be rewarding and, and you, the success comes more consistently you, that's when you when you really believe in the work part of it now the sports analogy makes a lot of sense i i don't know what that I never really put that like two and two together i yeah, guess i didn't until i watched that but it's like you think about professional athletes and you can't become a great athlete if you're only playing the games like Absolutely. if you just go out if you're a football yep. player and you're only playing on Friday nights, you're a high school player. You're yep. only playing on Friday nights. Well, you're never going to get any better Absolutely. unless you put the work in yep. outside. So, yep. postseason, in season stuff that makes it that. Yep. I no, just, you just made something click in my head. Yeah, it's like, like really maybe weird. it's just summertime and all I'm doing is getting inventory. But that maybe that one buck that I found in the summer out of a hundred or whatever is the one that I really got to know, and you know, it just led me to him. There's for maybe that one shed led me to a buck or every day in the woods. It's not like uh, you're accomplishing a big amount of something. It's I think it's more a lot of little things, little bits and pieces of information that eventually become a big thing. And then so the second thing I would say is probably mental. It's not it's not being a great shot. It's not even knowledge, but just creating like a confidence and not a not a confidence where you're bragging or not pride wise but just okay i know what i'm doing i know what it's right and i go through moments honestly where i feel like i have to chain myself with a lock to the tree stand like i'm it's like man this just doesn't this doesn't seem right i'm not seeing anything or but then I have to think about, no, you're, you're confident in what you do. Just, it, you're just going through a little phase, a little rough patch. And that's where I think a lot of people, if it doesn't come fast and easy, they're jumping around too often. They're trying this and that, and they're not just sticking to the game plan. So that's, you know, that's probably number two. And then number three, honestly, is, is cameras. I, I truly think trail cameras better than any weapon any product ever made trail cameras by far have been the greatest tool i've ever come upon i'm not just saying that because we're on a trail cam radio <laughs> podcast but there's nothing out there that keeps me going in the woods more than uh pictures of big bucks it's basically it's like having Say last year we ran 80 some cameras. So what's that like 160 eyes or something or however you say right. it, but it's eyes in the woods. It's, it's out there 24 seven and it's, it's by far probably the greatest motivational tool that you'll have to keep you out there. You know, you, you can sit in a stand all day and not see anything, but on your camera the day before a giant walk by, that's what kept you there all day. Yeah. So. Yeah. You start so, second guessing yourself and absolutely. start the mental uh, the mental gr grind and really I, I agree with you that's probably the hardest aspect of whitetail hunting is the yeah. mental side of beating yourself up but to your point when you can confirm what's going on with trail cameras it makes things yep you know, yeah easier. I watched a uh, like a history documentary one time of uh, they had, the sniper guy uh, they had surveillance of some some person they were after and uh, this sniper laid in a field for three days never never moved he said he crapped and pissed his pants but he <laughs> laid there three days for this guy to come out and i'm not saying i'm quite that severe when i'm hunting a big buck or but it, it just it's a good point like he had the intel he knew if he put his time in that eventually it would happen and that's what the camera does you know it, I'm not saying you can get a buck on any camera and it's guaranteed he comes back and you shoot him. It's not quite that, but it's still the greatest form of intel, especially when, if you've had history, years of history with an area or a buck in a certain spot and he's showing up there again, that's when I get locked in. That's mm -hmm. when I know, okay, 
it's happening here again. I'll put my time in and sooner or later, I'm willing to take the chances because I, I just, I believe that the odds will be in my favor eventually. Agreed. So. All right, well, let's, uh, we're at 50 minutes. So let's- uh, Yeah, that's pretty good. Move the motor on and get this thing wrapped up. So um, I guess, where can folks learn more about you and, and Shirk's, Shirk's Guide Service? Sure. Yeah, so just continue. Uh, if you've already been following me, I appreciate the more the more followers, the the better. And and there's, I've been so fortunate. There's been so many good people that follow me and that stand behind me what I believe. And and I'm and I'm also glad that that I do impact a lot of these people. But if you don't know me, I'm on Instagram at Shirks Guide Service or Facebook Shirks Guide Service. Or uh, if you're not social media person shirksguideservice.com so i uh, i do more than just try to uh, book hunts and guide people as you guys know i i like to i like i love deer hunting just like all of us in here i i, I write articles uh, i got people messaging me every day uh can you can at least give me some tips on this deer or, or should i be hunting or you know i'm i just love to be connected with with hunters and uh, that's what's great about it. It's not, it's not so much the money or uh, you know, saying I have a, a business. It's the, the connection I have with all the great deer hunters out there that, that I truly enjoy the most. So. Absolutely. Well, that's one of the things, uh, I guess that's really the reason why we think so highly of it. That's why you've probably, you. you're probably the most interviewed guest <laughs> on Trail Cam Radio. Um, it's the reason why you're uh, a Black Hat team member is right. because you're exactly what you just said and so. you guys are have been so good to me i uh and I, I like i've said before i don't just say it i love the exodus cameras i run as many as i can <laughs> and uh, uh i just appreciate you guys every time you do give me an opportunity uh, yep yep so. yep well we'll call that a wrap everybody uh we appreciate everyone listening watching us on youtube if you have any questions drop a comment below you know the routine smash the subscribe button for us if uh, you're checking this out, listening to it via podcast, um, we're always asking for written reviews to help us grow this thing and find new people. So uh, thanks for listening, everybody.